Hi everyone. So for this module and in this video, we will talk about a review on the basic statistical concepts. Now, in statistics, we perform two types or two major types of statistical methods. The one is the descriptive statistics and the other one is the inferential statistics. When we talk of descriptive statistics, we usually mean or look into the summary statistics because it provides us ways to show and summarize our data into meaningful ways. More often than not, the data that we receive or the data that we gather from our respondents usually don't show a pattern at all because they are just jumbled data that we encounter. However, we need to present this in a meaningful way. And to do that, we have to perform descriptive statistics. Because in this method, we try to analyze our data to recognize patterns and other pertinent observations. However, in descriptive statistics, it does not allow us to interpret or test our hypothesis, okay? It just merely describes how your data is occurring and it just only provides you ways to present your data. The most commonly used method in, uh, in descriptive statistics are your measures of central tendency, variability, and sometimes your measures of location. On the other hand, inferential statistics are methods that are used to test your hypothesis, okay? It's used to make an inference on a given set of data or variables of interest. We try to take into consideration inferential statistics, the different methods or the different sampling techniques because practically we cannot collect data from all of our population. To make our findings more solid, to make our hypothesis testable, we try to use inferential statistics. And when we and when we uh, when we do inferential statistics, we try to answer or use these methods. No, when we try to correlate variables, compare the outcomes or sometimes predict the outcomes, okay? The commonly used methods for this one are your t-test, your ANOVA, your linear regression, and your Pearson R, okay? But there are other tests or there are other measures or statistical methods that we can use based on the research question and the levels of measurement that we, that we try to use. Here is an example of our descriptive statistics. So here's, uh, in this example, this is a uh, quiz sum summary of our uh, students, of a group of students, wherein the average score was presented, okay? The highest score is 90% with a low score of 43% and having a standard deviation of 4.16, something like that. So in this particular example, we try to make, to make meaning, to present our data in a more meaningful way. We try to project, we try to present the scores of our students meaningfully, okay? And see patterns of data distribution. When we talk of inferential statistics, this is an example of an inferential statistics. Okay. Aside from the formula that we use for inferential statistics, okay, we try to run it on a we try to run it on a software. All right. So in this particular example, this is a, this is an inferential statistics of a researcher that is interested to know the crying time, the face pain, the leg pain, activity pain, crying pain, consolability, or the attitude of infants who are given. Uh, vaccination. 
All right? So she tried to introduce a, an intervention and tried to know if there's a difference between the two. So in trying to know the difference between the two, a T-test was conducted. Okay? The T-test was conducted and determined that there's significant difference. All right? So the, the, the main essence or the main purpose of uh, inferential statistics is to infer, okay? Is to make conclusion, uh, to test hypotheses, okay? And to arrive you know, into a sound uh, proof that our hypothesis should be accepted or not. Now, another, another uh, important concept that we must review is are your levels of measurement. Now, levels of measurement are important because this determines what type of statistical test you will use in the future. So in the future, when we, we, we progress with our, uh, with our discussion, the levels of measurement uh, will determine will determine the type of test that we will use, okay, alongside our research question. So the simplest level of measurement is what you call your nominal level. In the nominal level, the values of a certain variable are always fitted into categories, okay? Now, these categories are, should be, you know, should be mutually exclusive and exhaustive categories. What do, we, what do we mean when we say mutually exclusive and exhaustive categories? When we say mutually exclusive categories, these are categories that, uh, that are distinct to each other. That it should be distinct to each other that no one observation should fall on two categories. Meaning the, the categories in this, in this level should be distinct and should not be confusing or overlapping with each other. Now, when we talk of exhaustive categories, it means that all of the categories in a certain measurement should be, uh, should be exhausted, meaning it should be uh, inclusive of all possible responses that no one observation will be, le will be left uncategorized. So it means that your categories should cover all of your observations. All right? Now, many of the outcomes in the nursing or medical research are nominal uh, or at the nominal level. Okay? Like for example, the type of anemia, okay? Microcytic, macrocytic, or normocytic, right? the sex of a person being male or female, right? So those outcomes or those variables are nominal in nature. So that's why it's important to recognize it in research and moreover in statistics in nursing. Now, the observations that you make or that you record at the nominal level of measure are always considered qualitative in nature, okay? They are considered to be qualitative observations. They don't have numeric values. They're just there, all right, to, to categorize, to label your observations and to group them, okay? Therefore, the way to summarize this is to do frequencies to count them and do percentages or proportions. Now, the inferential statistics of choice for this level of measurement will always be non-parametric tests, okay? Will be non-parametric tests. Another level of uh, measurement that we need to know is your, or that we review, is your ordinal level of measure. When we talk of ordinal level measure, uh, it's, a, it's a level of measurement wherein Still, the values are categorized, but there is an inherent order with greater degree than each other that occurs among categories. 
So there's an inherent order that occurs among categories. Still, the level of uh, the level of uh, the, the the categories are mutually exclusive and exhaustive, and considered to be qualitative again in nature. Now, to summarize ordinal data, we have to summarize it by frequencies and percentages because the inherent order does not tell you uh, necessarily that one is greater than two. There's no distinct distance between ranks in an ordinal level of measure. Inherently, it's there, but you don't know the distance between two ranks. All right? So we have to summarize it by frequency and percentage because the values in, uh, in nominal level or ordinal level of measure don't have arithmetic values, okay? Now, the inferential step tests for this uh, type or, or th at this level of data are called or are, are considered to be non-parametric tests, okay? For example, your tumor stages, okay? Your tumor stages are categorized into zero, one, two, three, and four. So this two more stages, uh, even though they have, uh, they have, even though they have uh, values of zero, one, two, three, and four, it doesn't necessarily mean that one as uh, stage one of two more is directly uh, one point away from stage zero of your two more. So that's why even though it's numbered 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, all right, even though it's number 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, they still don't have an exact distance between ranks. All right, so that's why tumor staging is at the ordinal level of measurement. The next level of measurement is what you call your interval level of measure. Still, the, uh, the values are categorized and ranked, and they are mutually exclusive and exhaustive. But at this point, the distance between ranks are now specified, and that they have arithmetic value. Now, interval level of measure, their zero point is arbitrary. It means that it may change, it may, uh, the zero point or the lowest point may be at the zero or at the one, no? considering or depending upon the situation. Now, since this is, or this level of measurement has an arithmetic value, all right, it is considered to be a quantitative observation. Now, it is summarized by measures of central tendency, measures of central uh, tendency and their variability or spread. So the inferential statistic of choice for interval level of measure are your parametric tests, okay? Now, here are examples of your interval, uh, of your measurements at the interval level. For example, the bereavement scale, okay? Anxiety scales, no? Those are at the interval level of measure. Another example is your pain scale. The pain scale will always start, start at the lowest, one and the highest being 10, which may be arbitrary with all, uh, with all who will answer that scale. Another type of, or another level of measurement is your ratio level of measure. This is similar to your interval level of measure, but this time, the main difference would be an absolute zero point. It means that when, we, when, when a measurement has an absolute zero point, the zero point applies in all situation. So when it applies to all situation, it's more, uh, it's more effective or it's more applicable to all setting, all right? So to summarize, uh, this, this level of measure is summarized by measures of central tendency, okay, again, by, sent, uh, by measures of variability. And the inferential statistic of choice 
are your parametric tests. The examples of your ratio level of measures measure is your weight, your pulse rate. No? Now let's go to another uh, concept in, uh, in statistics, which is your sampling. And this is important because in research, we have to determine the sample that we need because it's not practical no, to collect data from the whole population. So the population is, uh, we have to, when we talk of, when, when we talk of sampling, we have to familiarize ourselves again with uh, the sampling terms that we use. So when we talk of uh, population, this is the entire aggregation of cases that meets a designated set of criteria in which you, the researcher, is interested in, okay? So if you're interested with all the nurses in the world, that's your population. But when you want to generalize your findings to a particular group of nurses or that population, let's say, for example, you want to target your population to, uh, you want to target your population to a group of, uh, to a group of, uh, of neonatal ICU nurses, right? You have to, that group of people will be your target population, okay? Now, another sampling term is your sampling population, okay? When we talk of sampling population, this is the population that, you are, that is actually available for you no? so that you can get your samples, okay? Now, Another sampling term is your sampling criteria, okay, which includes the characteristics you know, that are essential for inclusion and exclusion you know, in the target population. Another sampling term that we need to remember or to recall or to be reminded of is the actual list of the, is the actual list of the elements where we will get our sample. So this one is called your sampling frame, okay? The sampling frame or the actual list of the elements from which we get the sample and the sampling itself or the process of selecting a portion of your population to represent the entire population. When we talk of the sample, this is the subset of units that comprise the population. So each sample is composed of elements or the units that make up the sample or population. It is the most basic unit you know, which, uh, which uh, we collect our information. Like for example, your students, you know, your patients, a chart or a record. Now another something term that we need to remember is your random sampling. Okay, when we say random sampling, this is a technique wherein each and every member of the population has a probability higher than zero of being selected as a sample. Next is a random assignment, okay, or the procedure wherein you use to randomly assign its subject to treatment or control group. Okay, this is different from random sampling because in random sampling, you choose the people who will be part of your sample. In random assignment, this is different, no? Because in random assignment, you try to assign the subjects randomly no? to either treatment or experimental group, okay? Now, when we talk of sampling error, this is the difference between the population values and the sample values. While when we talk of sampling bias, this is the systematic over or under representation of a segment of the population. Now, there are different types of sampling designs. You know? The one that uses randomization is what you call your probability sampling. The one that does not use randomization is called your non-probability sampling, okay? So in probability sampling, we have your simple random sampling, systematic random sampling, stratified random sampling, and multi-stage random sampling. 
While in non-probability sampling, we use convenience, purposive, quota, and network sampling. In simple random sampling, we try to assign, we do this by trying to assign numbers to our sampling frame. And based on our sampling frame, no, we get a table of random digits and then randomly pick one number from it. And once we pick a, a random number, we try to find that person in our list. So for example, I pick, randomly pick number 47, okay? So when I pick number 47, I will look into my list or sampling frame and select the number 47 as my uh, element or the first element of my sample size. I will repeat this until I completed my sample size. So that's how we do simple random sampling. Another method of simple random sampling is your fishbowl technique, wherein you write the names of your respondents or of your population in equally sized and same colored papers, all right, and place it inside the fishbowl and you pick randomly from this group until you achieve your sample size. Another method is what you call your systematic random sampling. In systematic random sampling, it involves the computation of a sampling interval, okay, which is represented by K. Now, the sampling interval is computed as follows, capital N divided by small n, where capital N is the target population, while the small n is our sample size. So for example, if we have a population of 30 and uh, we want a sample size of six, we divide 30 by six to get five. So it means that when, when our sampling interval is, is five, this is the interval of samples in the sampling frame where we get our sample, okay? So now that we determine our sampling interval, we must first identify our first student by randomly picking a person. Let's say, for example, we pick person number 11. And when we get uh, the person number 11, we count now five intervals to get the next one. So 11, 2, 3, 4, and 5. The fifth student or the fifth student in the list after the first randomly picked person will be your second element. So on and so forth until you reach your sample size of six. When we do stratified random sampling, we try to separate the, 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 the population into naturally occurring strata or subgroups. Like for example, in a group, in a classroom where there are multiple students, we try to uh, separate or we try to stratify them by their sex, either by male or by female. Then we get equal samples from those strata. Now, we, all, we can also do proportionate random sampling, okay? Proportionate random sampling wherein uh, we try to compute okay, by ratio or, or proportion. For example, in a target population of 100 with 60 males and 40 females, we want no, to determine the proportionate number of males and females for sample size of 20. So to proportionate it, for example, if we want, uh, if we want to do it, we divide, uh, we, we set the proportion of males to the whole number of population, which is 60 over 100. Uh, do it by uh, cross multiplication, you get 12 males and eight females, all right? So that's how we do proportionate random, uh, stratified random sampling. 
Other types of sampling include the non-probability sampling, wherein you don't apply randomization okay, in selecting your participants. Okay. It can be convenience or accidental, wherein you, where, wherein you involve all available respondents at any given circumstance in your study. So let's say, for example, you arrive in a classroom and you included all students in that classroom in your study. That's convenience sampling, all right? The next is purposive or judgmental sampling. In purposive or judgmental sampling, you as the researcher, you use your knowledge no? and your, your needs on data when you determine the samples to be included in your study. For example, you wanted to study the lives of uh, mothers who have uh, aborted their child. Then by purposive sampling, you determine that you will interview those who have aborted their children. Another is your, another sampling technique in the non-probability uh, setup is your quota or filtering, quota uh, sampling wherein you filter your samples based on certain criteria, okay? It's like stratified random sampling, but rather you're choosing only a, a certain criteria, okay, to arrive to a more homogeneous sample. Another type of sampling is networking, okay, or network sampling. This is also known as snowball sampling, wherein you ask, your current respondents or your current samples for referrals to increase and meet your number of samples or your sample size. Now, to determine now uh, we, to determine our sample size, there are two uh, major methods. Okay, it can be done by estimation or by computation. Okay. By estimation, we mean we can estimate a large sample size, which is around 50% of our target population. Or we can determine the sample size by estimation by a small estimate, which is around 30% of the target population. By computation, we do it, uh, we do it by using Slovin's formula, okay, which, is, uh, which is a reference to the level of significance or your alpha. Okay, we usually set at 0 0.05, 0 0.01, and 0 0.001. Okay, by Slovin's formula, we do it by uh, we we use the formula of one over one plus n e squared. All right, but by computation, we can use also the beta or the probability of committing type two error by using power analysis. All right. So we can use it by the use of calculators, okay, or using the table of effect sizes, which are indicated in some books no, that uh, recommend this particular method. The last part of our presentation or of our discussion will be about the data presentation. When we talk of data presentation, this is the way you show your data in your paper. Most researches, when you write your paper, you always need to use tabular presentation. But sometimes you can also use graphical presentation in the forms of bar or column chart, a pie graph, a line graph, a histogram, or a scatter plot diagram. So here's an example of a tabular presentation of your data. So notice that this is in APA format, which is the which which I may remind you you will be using in your research papers. All right. So notice that there's a table number, a table title, a subheading, and a table spanner if you're presenting multiple data. All right. And your uh, and your your table should also contain column headings, row headings. Okay, and, and your totals, all right? Now, uh, when we talk of uh, tables, sometimes uh, you may need, no? You may need to present your notes. 
notes that are that contain some explanations or supplementary data to clarify your information in the table body. If there are some uh, uh, if there are some some legends that you used in your in your table, you need to also indicate that in your lower part or lower portion of your table after the notes. Now, if you use some uh, some sources or if you use uh, other people's data and you tabulated it on your own, you need to cite that table as well using the APA format. So here are some other representations or you can have uh, data presentation methods that you can use. So this one is what you call your pie graph wherein this is used to show the proportion of each response to the whole, no? So when doing, uh, when doing, uh, when you uh, when you do your pie graph, always make sure that they are arranged from the most number of uh, responses down to the least and to the others. Okay. All right. So let me repeat that. So when you present your data, you need to present it from the highest number of frequency down to the lowest. And the last one should be if you have categories of others, okay? So the presentation should be clockwise, all right? As you can notice in this example, the data is presented in clockwise manner and descending manner, clockwise and descending. Always remember that the others should always be placed on the last. Even if it's not the lowest value, as long as it falls on the others category, it should be presented last. Another type of, uh, of data presentation is your bar graph, wherein you use this to compare means, to compare absolute values, okay? of any given set of data. Like for example, in this part, they try to compare the death rate for coronary artery bypass graft. So hospital D as the lowest, okay? And hospital C is around 11%, okay? Or rate of death for every uh, thousands of patients. The next type of uh, data presentation is your histogram, wherein you try to plot the frequencies, okay? You can plot it in frequencies. Now, this data or type of uh, data presentation is used to make sure or to make or to, to, to project your data and its distribution. Another type of... Uh, Mesh of data presentation is what you call your line graph, where in the line graph, you try to trend your data over time, okay? So in this example, you can see that the number of patients admitted in a certain hospital or in, uh, in a certain country <clears throat> from 1995 to the year 2000 is projected, no? So we, we, use, we use line graph to trend our data with respect to time. All right. Another type of data uh, presentation is your scatter plot, wherein you try to compare or you try to plot, okay, a certain value of your uh, independent variable, no, to a particular outcome or dependent variable. So it's like scattering or it's like a scatter plot because each value on the x-axis may have different response for your Y variable, okay? So here are my references for my presentation. And that ends our discussion of our first module, a review on the basic concepts in statistics.